to engage in that and uh, embark on the, on the research for it, which turned out to be a little bit more than I actually had hoped. So <laughs> yeah, it, so now you can, it's kind of a mix of, of things that popped up in, in the you know, reconsideration of these older ideas. And then, you know, it's not about algorithmic music in general. There are different topics there to talk about, but live coding more um, specifically. So live coding, I think, has from the very beginning on uh, always had some, uh, you know, a tendency to play with, with time or has a lot of time words in it, like, for example, live coding, <laughs> the liveness as a time thing, the temporal organization, I mean, that it's gone soon, I mean, an empty future, or perhaps, you know, it will uh, make itself unnecessary, probably it has already. Uh, uh. Uh, then just in time programming, just for anyone who doesn't know, that was tongue in cheek, you know, that was not serious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, then uh, not to forget the shreds, you know, the most serious thing in computer science um, that was, you know, played with um, in chalk. Then temporal recursion, of course, uh, one, one thing, like how can you recurse in time? Um, and not to forget, you know, the night time, <laughs> the night time that makes uh, spaces differently and uh, like writing code at night that's a totally normal thing but mm -hmm. writing code of course in nightclubs is an unusual thing <laughs> so yeah and so on you can you know if you have um, others uh, I'd be happy so what is our I, I used the hour you know before I was uh, uh, I was made, made aware that you know the we is a dangerous formula but I love it anyway so what are we how are we using time <laughs> So uh, we, are we using it? Are we using it up? Are we abusing it? Mm -hmm. This morning was a very nice session in slowness and like abusing time in a productive way. Then perhaps we analyze it in a certain way by performing. You know, that's, a, that's a perspective that I like a lot. Analytic art, you know, as epistemic art, something like that. Or are we making it up? You know, like are we generating time? Like, you know, as an, perhaps as an illusion, as a country construction or something. All these perspectives are maybe there. So um, there is a there is an old paper by Donald Knuth where he compares mathematics um, and computer science um, by random random access to his bookshelf and mm -hmm. just picking out random problems and analyzing them really carefully in his paper and then looking for different <coughs> things. It's not so important, that's why I made it, you know, you can't read it. But um, there, are, there are two things that, that for him, mathematics as, you know, as it were in his textbooks empirically, and computer science or you know, informatics, or as he would like to call it algorithmic, um, would, would be typical for algorithmic thought. Um, one thing is a lack of infinity for some reason. I think that's still a myth that computers can't deal with infinity. I would like to dispel that because um, you know, in, in mathematics, infinity is not that much of a problem, but it's also a way of writing. So you know, we shouldn't forget that you know, there's a distance between the medium of inscription and what we're talking about. So of course, uh, computers can deal with infinity. But that was his first point. And the second point was the assignment operator that appears in, um, uh, in computer science. And that's, I think that's interesting because that's the, the moment of intervention or the moment of break or the moment of state, the whole state thing is a problem. Uh, you know, even in pure functional programming, your whole program is a state, so the problem is still there. <laughs> um, so the question I would like to um, kind of consider together is what can live coding tell us about time? And um, you know, like, 
maybe nothing because uh, it's all about processes and so on, not about time itself. Um, and, but then also the other way around, what, what is it that perhaps um, we can learn from philosophy of time or thinking about time for life? So, um, oh, so yeah, we have this weird ambiguity and this is a classic in philosophy of time. You know, when like I think uh, important text, uh, important author is of course Kant. For him, time was just a form of possible experience. So it is not something you can talk about like an object because it is already the precondition of your discourse, basically. It's what is today often talked in terms of media. Like, you know, you can't, it's, it's really kind of hard to write about the conditions of writing. Of course, you can, you can say, you know, let's do it, you can do it. But there is something like a horizon in it, perhaps. So we are on the verge of, you know, of, of a rationality that allows um, to talk about things like its own limits or perhaps not. So I think one should leave that question open in a certain way. Um, but there is a problem that, um, which I mean, was one of the reasons why I can't have this idea, is that um, things that happen in time always happen in time, and that's not time itself. So if you look at movements, of course you can say uh, movements, a, a clock, for example, moves, the hands of a clock move, so that's time, but that's of course could argue that's not time, it's just a measuring of time, but are you really measuring time or are you measuring the mechanics of that clock? Um, so changes and events are one level that's very, that are very close to time, that have a kind of medial relationship. And algorithms and causality is a general other thing that is laws that kind of bridge time over a long time, um, like the planetary movements, like the clocks or the, the you know, any kind of process that has a law, I would call a law, or, or some constant, constancy over time, bridges time. So um, I think in this triangle we have to kind of move around and orient ourselves, and I think it's a bit undecided where we access a knowledge of time. So in the, uh, when we had this dark stool meeting, we thought a bit about how actually live coding appeared, what was the essential bits, and I mean, you know, I don't want to make anything essential about live coding, it's, a, it's about making things in a certain way unessential, but historically, what, what is it that brought live coding together as it is today? And I think it was this combination of thinking in public, like when people sit on stage and they actually think, it's actually rarer than, than we normally uh, think that it is, right? Um, and I think we should, should really do that actively. And then changing laws while we obey them, in a sense, or changing grammars while we speak. That was this, you know, changing grammars, or changing algorithms while they unfold, or changing programs while they run. So these are the, um, so th these two things, and I would like to consider a little bit how these two things kind of fit together in, in a certain way. So, um, yeah, the yeah, I know that the manifesto should be reworked, but that kind of thing should stay. Right? Algorithms are thought. So what is thought? I mean, it's, it's not as clear as, as, as it seems to be in the, in the beginning. So, um, I mean, this situation where you sit on stage and think, or even, you know, like when, when you teach, or even when you have a conversation with friends or colleagues, this, this thinking, what is it that? that happens when you really think and not just, you know, talk. You know. It's, it's, I mean, it is really that what one doesn't know. Right? I mean, it's, it's this performance of not knowing and still kind of getting to know something. I think that's, yeah, that, that needs, needs its own time to, to, and to accept that someone in public doesn't know really, it, also, you know, that's something that I think from school we are all used to, um, to, used to this uh, arrangement that not knowing is a really bad thing, especially when you're in this position, yeah? <laughs> um, <laughs> or when you're exposed. You, when you, as soon as you're exposed, you should know what you're doing. But I think that's a, a very problematic thing because usually you don't, and that you know that, that, that kind of there's a lot of fake front coming up, and we don't know. Well, we know of course, but we don't know for sure, and um, I think uh, we shouldn't kind of throw away all rationality in that sense, you know, oh, I want to be just crazy, uh, we try still to understand, otherwise it's like you know, the 
contention is lost. I mean, trying to understand but not fully understanding is something that, that is very, very interesting. So what is really not there so much is this, this transparent feeling of, of being in control of oneself or of, of even understanding what the others are doing. And the second aspect, I think, is that algorithms uh, and their accounts for computer music in general, they really have no necessary connection to our human body or to our human kind of constraints and so on. That has often been framed in terms of the, the separation of the, of the mind and the body and so on. One doesn't have to do that. One just can say, you know, neutrally say, speaking, our cultural uh, limit between nature and culture is not obeyed by algorithms. And perhaps, you know, thought is something that is already in between that border. And we may have more liminal states anyway than, than, than we think we have. Um, there's, a, there's a famous debate in, in music, um, Stockhausen versus Grisé, um, where Stockhausen in uh, Zeit vergeht um, cl claims this kind of <coughs> total uniform time between timbre and rhythm where everything is basically ruled by the same law. And Grisé says, well, if I don't perceive it, what is it? So, so uh, you know, and he has this question, who perceives stuff? You know, who, who? And I think who we should really ask because we just don't know. We don't know what a human being really is and what it will be. Um, of course, sometimes there are limits. We can, you know, like, so, but within these limits, certainly we don't know who will perceive what. And everyone knows that who composes music. Some people understand something and others don't. So I think there is a, there is a very, a particular moment of alienation in this whole um, in this whole process, and I would propose to to see alienation not per se as a negative thing, as it was you know kind of taken for granted in part of the Marxist tradition, but only part actually of the Marxist tradition um, that you know alienation is opposed to autonomy. Well, it is in a certain way. That's true. But autonomy is not something good in itself, and alienation is not something bad in itself. But it has to do with delegation of, of agency to some processes we cannot fully control. And actually, there's a, there's a very different aspect in, in it. It's, it's trust. Um, if you trust something, you can delegate it and give it away, and you can lose control. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but kind of a certain way of using power makes it a bad thing. I mean, alienation, become, alienation becomes a bad thing as soon as there are certain power relations. So one can think of different kinds of alienation. So, so yeah, so one way of course is uh, alienate, alienating when you kind of, uh, walk across or along this border uh, between things that are kind of within our central apparatus and not within our central apparatus. The question is how to get to this kind of outside um, how to perceive something that's not in our sensual experiential frame, you know, not, not in the form of experience we, we, uh, we are used to. And I think, uh, uh, you know, in a way, thought can be seen as some, something like that. It's an indirect experience. So, I mean, it's just a redefinition now to propose that thought equals, you know, <laughs> with a assigned to <laughs> indirect experience. Um, just as a so again, then algorithms are you know, thoughts, not chainsaws. Then, in, in, far, in how far are algorithms indirect experiences of time in that sense? Yeah, that would be a sort of possible possible uh, reply to the Kantian question: How do you, how you know your horizon? Of course, for Kant, it was mathematics, which is actually okay. You know, yeah, algorithms are also mathematics. So there is, there is something like an epistemic non-violence there. Uh, you can, you know, the, the term epistemic violence has, uh, is, is important that frames of, of rationalities create a kind of violence, but you can also say that frames of rationalities can deter certain or, or, or protect from certain violence. So that, that would be the standard. So, um, okay, so we'll move this diagram a little bit but not too much situations. Um, time and algorithms would be kind of the triangle we are moving between trying to find where we can say anything about time. So um, 
I'm trying to, you know, that was a bit strange because I have to read it out like this. So that's Derrida. I'm, 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 I'll quote a bit from those philosophers that have expired the early history of life coding for myself. So not, uh, I, I'm now reading more others, but still I think in terms of philosophy of time, the post-constructionists are really quite interesting. If the living present, the absolute form of the opening of time to the other in itself, is the absolute form of ecological life, and if egoity is the absolute form of experience, then the present, the presence of the present, and the presence of the presence, that's the French word, are all originally and forever violent, because it's a kind of incorporation of the other in, in the self, you know, in the self-transparency. <coughs> the living present is originally marked by death. Presence as violence is the meaning of finitude, the meaning of meaning as history. So you can see that there is a, a, a presence suddenly becomes a really negative term. Usually we use presence as a really positive one. And I think it's interesting that you can also turn it around and say, no, this self-presence is actually violent in a, in a certain way. And this break with this presence or with this uniform presence, let's say, um, is an is a act of kind of epistemic non-violence. Um, so a liminal time which is half outside and half inside, something mm -hmm. like present or so, would be interesting. Well, I mean, we know all that. Um, so that would be a little bit about public thought, what could public thought be? So changing laws would be a way to think, um, think about that problem of time. Um, so there, uh, in a way, you can say that life coding has always been a critique of real time with a means of real time, but it has also been a critique, of course, of the timeline and, and all that. But uh, I think the, the critique of the liveness as now is, is very strong and has been strong from the very beginning. Because if you, I mean, if you look at the papers about time that have been published in computer science, or for music or like in, at the ICMC or so, it's like all about real time. And that was of course fascinating. Computers can suddenly be faster than the sound they need to produce. That was a very important moment without doubt. But it kind of encapsulated the thinking of music in terms of parameter changes. You set up an architecture and then you change parameters in it. And live coding was a break with this setting up of parameters. It's the refactorizing of structures and even structures of structures and so on, rather than just um, a structure where you change the parameter of life, which, which is what a lot of live electronic music was before, yeah. exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, so how does time enter into algorithms? I think that's a, an interesting question because algorithms can be thought of as timeless in a certain way or unfolding in logical time in mathematical time, in not a physical time. Um, so there is a, a, a double meaning in the word pro program, which I like. I mean, program is a written program or a specified program, but it's also a running program. That's weird, <coughs> but it, I think we all get used to it. Now I think one says app, right? But that's a <laughs> <laughs> that, that unfortunately it doesn't work anymore. Mm. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, the computer science part of it, um, at the bottom, of course, you can, al you can always have systems that are partly kind of provable in terms of consistency. Um, and also, well, they, they are incomplete in such a specific way that you, um, you kind of never have a problem with them. But certainly in the moment of, of construction, when you think about or think with probes, Program, a programming language or so, you always encounter something like um, a, a kind of a debugging because something is not as you expected. So there is an internal openness or also a kind of contradiction in them. But the error, you can suspend the error in a certain way. And live coding does suspend the error by simply putting exactly the time variable or the, the, the um, suspense, the waiting time in the place where you normally have a contradiction, like in the loop, you know, if you had, I mean, you just leave away the wait or something in a loop and you get exactly what the halting problem uh, in a sense means. 
Not really, but that's another thing. Um, so the other thing is that um, programs kind of always do slightly what, what you didn't expect. And because they unfold in time and the effects are not really predictable in a certain way. I mean, of course, with experience you can know, but in terms of uh, attribute, if you're looking for, for a certain sound attribute, for example, you cannot prove that it will be there because it's just uh, not, not complete in that sense. So you, you always you encounter an algorithm in its unfolding. So it, it's, it's always something of the past that you once planned in order um, a dead kind of a, a past future. That's what's called ontology, um, a past future that uh, befalls you. So programs are late in the sense of dead, right? um, and so realization is a, uh, is a retrospective one in a sense. Um, so there is a thing you know, that I always use for um, showing why live coding is kind of impossible. Um, this is the simplest possible function you can have, you know, just a linear function. Imagine on T0 you start a process, say it's a raise it rising uh, frequency or something, and at T1 you suddenly have uh, some reason, you know, some situational reason or internal reason in the system to say, no, actually it should rise at a different rate, you know, the, the, the steepness should be different. So at this point you, you have a um, a decision to do it differently. So now you rewrite the program to change that. So, but now actually you have the choice, in a sense, to either follow the lower line, right? And that means your your description, your text <coughs> doesn't uh, doesn't correspond anymore with your signal. Right? I mean, you suddenly have a signal that's like this, and your your code says f of x or, or a a a t or something like that. Um, or you do you say you do it differently and you say ah you, I would have actually had written <laughs> would have uh, I should have written uh, it from the very beginning so you have to do the unfolding again and I just realized that the pro the, the diagram is wrong just imagine the dotted line to be moved to the red line uh, that would be the other actually but no it doesn't matter. I mean you, you you get so in a sense live coding as this kind of transparent relation between text and, and processes, there, there's something um, impossible about it. And I would claim that this impossibility is what really drives live coding and makes it interesting. Uh, or at least, so yeah, it's impossible. So um, a good example for, for a similar thing, um, and the longer I, I mean, I was skeptical in the beginning, but the longer I look at it, the better it, it seems to be, although it's still an open question um, whether it's, it's right. It's, is the idea of complementarity that comes from originally Heisenberg and Bohr, and uh, you know it's a complicated question because it's fully uh, in embedded. This term of complementarity is fully embedded in the struggles within the philosophy of quantum physics, which I don't want to touch now. A little bit later, but in general, um, there, there's an interesting story that already Norbert Wiener, perhaps, but actually then Landé and uh, Stuart and Gabor have. Um, created a theory of sound, which is strictly formally analogous to quantum mechanics. And uh, Curtis Rhodes had written a book, basically inspired by it, which is the microsound book. Right? So, um, in uh, roughly in, in quantum mechanics, um, you have a causal picture. I use these terms, which are not totally common, but they have been used. A causal picture where you have some causal relation that you can talk about, it's like momentum or something, and you have a state picture which, which tells you that you know, a particle is in state, in a certain state, in a certain moment, and those two pictures don't fit together at the same time. So you can either do this or that, but not both at the same time, and the big question of course is, does the world really have these properties, kind of these contradictory ones, or are they just arti artifacts of our observation? In acoustics, and it's pretty simple, you have the same thing. Of course, you can make a time point um, of a, of a waveform at any time, but when you want to have, s when you want to know what sound is there at that point, uh, you're kind of at loss because there is no sound at that point, in a certain sense, if you mean a spectrum or something. Um, so in the extreme, uh, in the kind of extreme picture, you can say a, a, a pure frequency in terms of the Fourier spectrum, 
does simply not exist in one type time. It does not even exist in a limited time, but it only exists in infinity. So you have these two complementary pictures, and formally you can translate them into each other. So that's, that was uh, Gabor's suggestion to have this elementary logon, this kind of minimal frame where you, you have a compromise between frequency and, um, and time, uh, which he then tuned. It's a, he then moved to information uh, theory. I mean, the whole paper is on information theory. And he tried to see what information is actually contained. We can forget about this whole information stuff, I think, because that's very much into in the telecommunication and cybernetics of the 50s or 40s in this case. Um, just you know, see it conceptually for a moment. Um, uh, and what you can see here, and I think what I would like to point out is that there is a F parameter there and a T parameter. So. T, it, depending on what way you look at it, T of, of uh, time and frequency are really symmetrical. And um, for Gabo, he was inspired by this whole uh, frequency modulation thing. And he said, you know, the, the idea of frequency is totally wrong in, um, in uh, the sciences, or I mean, in mathematics, not, but in the physics, uh, because a changing frequency is kind of an inconsistent uh, concept. But um, what, uh, and so, so he never really asked the question, what about the time? Right? So actually, time, the time point is just as inconsistent in a certain way as the frequency. Right? It's totally symmetrical. I mean, just formally, it's just the same. So I would like to just keep that symmetry. The time point is just as, as, as open as the frequency um, uh, question. So presence is not existence. That, that is one of the central thesis, I think, in the philosophy of time in the second half of the 20th century, in a certain sense, or partly also in the first. But I think it's a good thing to, to understand that what exists does not necessarily exist now. Um, it, it's just a kind of mental picture one can try to cultivate. Um, so just to compare it with something, someone told me, ah, oh, yeah, magenta doesn't exist. I was like, oh, what does magenta doesn't exist? That's really strange. Um, why does it not exist? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not part of the colors of the color spectrum. Well, is, is that true? Well, no, actually, no. Actually, the, the spectrum exists, but it, there's no line, no single line that is magenta. Obviously, what? Okay, but why doesn't it, ex it exist? So, why don't mixtures or spectra or m multiplicities in general exist? That's a very strange assumption, actually, but it's very widespread. So we should be a bit aware of that background assumption. That's kind of a very crude empiricism that doesn't really work. Um, so just another quote from Time Today, which inspired us to, for the article Algorithms Today. Then. Um, because it is absolute, the presenting present cannot be grasped. It is not yet or no longer present. It's always too soon or too late to grasp presentation itself and present it. Such is the specific and paradoxical constitution of the event. That something happens, the occurrence means that the mind is disappropriate. So this disappropriation, this alienation, somehow comes from time itself. So the, of course the question is whether time does that to us while time is this union of things, or whether time is itself kind of um, alienated. Um, that's a question yeah, that I will leave open in the end. So the same thing I think we can say for algorithms. Uh, on a different time scale, we don't have to go into this small time scale of microsound or anything. Um, we can just add algorithmic complementarity to the picture in a sense that in algorithms, you also have a causal picture, which is kind of the prescription. It's the, it's the program as description. And you have a state picture, which is the process as it goes, like the, the state in a certain kind of moment. And these actually have the same kind of complementarity, but the funny thing is that it stretches out in like any time scale you want. It's, and it has to do with laws that, that um, exist over time and that actually con that, that are laws for things to happen, like, I mean, gravity, but there are other laws, like smaller laws, if you want, that, that are more local, that are kind of laws of the situation, I would say. And laws of the situation, they can change, but it's interesting why, uh, like why they are stable, and it's also interesting what happens when they change, because 
at the same time, somehow the past needs change, or I don't know. I, I this view. So um, what started off as a di discrepancy in the, f in the first place when you suddenly think, oh, I should change that, or as an uh, a reason for intervention, that's a certain state. Uh, in a certain moment, there's a state that causes you to change something. You hear something that may also come from the past, you know, we'll just kind of smear it all over the place, but there is some state picture that causes you to, to make an intervention. And then um, on the other side, your, um, your causal picture gets fragmented necessarily to a certain degree. And I think there are many, many different solutions also to that, to make that not a total irrational thing, but to make that uh, a kind of um, interesting thing that this happens and to make that still thinkable and, and I mean, even controllable, but also passively interesting that you experience it in an interesting way. So yeah, the question is, is time now really self alienating? You know, like, is it time that is alienating itself or is it just um, the processes or whatever that happen in time or even others. So um, again, this picture we have all this. We have the idea of passage in the state picture. We have the causal picture, which is more like an encounter. Um, uh, I guess you can also switch them around. I thought about it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, sometimes symmetries are dangerous. Um, but it's not really clear whether you know. It could be a real di dilemma. Well, uh, it's interesting, intrinsic to what, where does it, uh, where is it? Um, then it could be a thing of technology, particularly, um, or it could uh, be a misunderstanding on my side. Um, that would be also possible, perhaps, or something even, you know, something else. Um, so, um, yeah, um, maybe this will um, help us so yeah, um, I would like to pass the word to the audience and uh, make comments, you know, also questions, but not only questions, but comments are also welcome. I don't know how much time we have left. No. I have no clock. <laughs> 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 uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah, that would be nice if, you know, don't, uh, don't worry. It <laughs> um, doesn't have to be, you know, it can be a very, uh, very stupid. Yes. I could not quite understand whether you've integrated into your thoughts are our understanding of perception of time. I'm thinking of people like you, because the way I look at it is that there is no such thing as a linear time scale perception. Yeah. There are multiple non-linear subscales. In many ways, this could be seen as parallel to the way that uh, systems of spiking neurons operate multiply together with different time scales.
curious, uh, well, how do you see a difference between uh, life coding and uh, undeterministic future? Just yeah. And uh, what do you see a difference between life coding and uh, just pushing the play button? Because uh, uh, you could say with your arguments yeah. that uh, playing a song is not going to be deterministic, you know, because it's not happened yet. But yeah. somehow it's still going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean uh, pushing a play button and and listening to the kind of a total like unpredictable thing are kind of one ends of a spectrum uh, you can mm -hmm. still you know can still imagine that as possible practices of life coding i would say you know like push, why not push a button it's not forbidden right yeah. um but i mean you know the kind of the, the the whole tension appears elsewhere where um laws actually are taken seriously as existing and you experiment with laws not just with total indefiniteness um, often freedom has been kind of intuitively characterized with this kind of total openness towards uh, a, a kind of a noise background of the universe, <laughs> something like that. And, uh, you know, maybe that doesn't really exist in that sense. Uh, maybe it's more that different laws are contradictive to, uh, uh, contradict each other, and so you cannot bring them <coughs> in one picture. And so switching from law to law is something far more interesting, and I think that, that would be more my picture of life coding. How are laws that are, have no law of laws, mm. and no second order law related anyway? I use the word, you know, in, as a technical term, almost. Um, you know, in philosophy, thought has a very, very strong touch to it. You know, it's like, it's like politics. You know, it's a, it's something not just uh, thinking along and no, 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 dreaming. Or something. It's really engaging in thought, um, and it's, 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 it has this kind of very strong dialectical and very strong. Mm questioning uh, character in it. So that's why I kind of used it. But then in a sense, like, uh, like stepping one, one step back and relaxing a little bit from that strong position, um, one can think what is really like the typical thing about thinking. And this, this separateness from direct experience, this indirectness is probably an interesting way to still keep a specificity of, of thought while allowing it to spread all over, right? I mean, you can say a gesture is a thought, but only under the condition that it, it, it's an, it, it makes, it has a very specific kind of non-immediacy or non, uh, it has, must have some kind of indirectness. Uh, let's say this. For me, I come more from, in that sense, more from but you. And for me, the machine is just as much discourse as, um, you know, I'm not, I, I tend not to, uh, in the German media theory, I think, you know, not German media theory, but in 
in the technical, technological a priori, which is just you know, a, a, a small part of German media theory. Um, uh, it has a, a very, you know, you have to understand that uh, Hitler was, it was very important for him to make the statement very strong because he was in a total, like, arrogant surroundings of hum humanists who just studied language as if it were just about reading the, understanding the deeper meaning and so on, not totally ignoring anything like technology. So of course you need to make technology strong. But then, I mean, I would say, you know, even look behind it, I would say technology is, is interesting because it's an indirect means. I mean, it's media in the sense that it's transparent also. So definitely I totally agree that, you know, like discourse is not everything in, in the strong sense, like ontology, that's why I asked my question about time in the, an ontological way. But I think the answer is not to study technology, but to use technology to study time or something like that, or study being. Um, and there's, I think the, there's a misunderstanding about this horizon. Uh, th there are people who have moved this Kantian horizon basically to technology. Mm. And I mean, there's th actually in, the Kittler, in Kittler's text, you can see it in the early text, there's a switch between contingency to the technology in a certain moment. And I think I would rather stay with the contingency as a stronger point and to say, no, let's stay with situations and study them carefully with whatever means available, like not a priori, make anything, make technology here and discourse there, because I mean, how to separate them? It's all in a sense ideology if you want, um, but also it's not. Um, so there is a, a weird intermediate field that gets lost uh, if, if one kind of makes a strong te technological a priori because it's an anthropological horizon in the end. It's a historicism, which, uh, which I find a bit dangerous. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.